Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Emily Summer, and I am the buyer at here at East City Bookshop. We are so glad you're with us. If you've never been before, welcome to the store. A special welcome to everybody who is watching us on Zoom. We have a pretty large virtual audience tonight, so thank you all for tuning in. For the purposes of our Zoom audience, I will ask that during the Q&A portion tonight, if you're asking a question from this audience, please speak up. And I'll also ask Heather and Vanessa to repeat the question into the mic um, and to speak into the mic during the event. And that's for the benefit of everybody who's watching on the computer for the live stream. If you have never been to the bookstore before, we do author events like this multiple times a week. Please check out our website, sign up for our e-newsletter, look at us on social media and come back to the next event we have that piques your interest. If you are here with us in the store and you need a bathroom, those are upstairs past the register and the greeting cards. And if you will please also silence your cell phones if you have a ringer on. And now for the reason that we're here. Vanessa Wilkie is the William A. Moffat Senior Curator of Medieval Manuscripts and British History and Head of Library Curatorial at the Huntington Library, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens. She has a PhD in British History and Gender History and an MA in Public History from the University of California, Riverside. She lives in Los Angeles. And because East City Bookshop is not just a store, but also a community space, where we like to get to know each other, our customers, our event participants, our authors. I have to also say that she is my best friend's sister-in-law. So it's a small world. We love it. We love to see it. A Woman of Influence is Vanessa's first book. And in our bookstore marketing materials, we have made much of the fact that she is a forebear of Princess Diana. But what Vanessa's book illustrates so beautifully is that Alice Spencer was a remarkably powerful and independent woman in her own right. Vanessa has managed to blend her own keen historical insights into a compulsively readable, endlessly fascinating book that reads like a novel. In conversation with Vanessa tonight is Heather Wolf, the curator of manuscripts and an associate librarian at the Folger Shakespeare Library. She publishes widely on the weird and wonderful world of manuscripts in early modern England and teaches people how to read Tudor handwriting. I hope that we will have a question on that tonight. No pressure. Vanessa is currently working on projects about writing paper, Shakespeare's coat of arms, and Margaret Cotton, a Cambridge pewterer's wife accused of witchcraft in 1603. We are thrilled to have them both in conversation here this evening. Thank you very much for being at East City Bookshop and welcome Vanessa and Heather. Here is. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you for having me and for being Molly's best friend so that we can all be together. Um, and to clarify, Heather is the one who works on this amazing witchcraft story and um, the heraldry. Uh, before we start, I do want to just say um, not only just how grateful I am to be here, but also just to, to share that part of the book does deal with a, a, an abusive family and, and sexual violence. So for everyone out there, just please take care of uh, take care of each other. Let's take care of each other when we talk about these difficult subjects that may come up because it's an important part of the book. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, the format for tonight, we think is going to be a conversation between Vanessa and me and you as well and our audience via zoom so keep the questions coming we want this to be as informal as we can make it um, and i think we'll start by just because i'm sure you haven't all gotten a chance to read the book cover to cover yet uh, vanessa will just give a quick overview of the the narrative of the book and then we'll start the conversation yeah, so the story really follows the life of one woman, Alice Spencer Stanley Edgerton, the Dowager Countess of Derby, um, which just rolls right off your tongue. <laughs> it's like pure poetry. Um, and as as Emily said, and, and East City has made the most amazing memes about um, the, the Princess Diana connection. Um, but she was born at Althorpe in 1560. Uh, so shortly after Queen Elizabeth came to the throne in England, and the the story follows the arc of her life, she lives to be 77 years old, which is a, a good long life in the 17th century, she has, uh, she serves under the reign of three monarchs. Um, and the story is really about her, yes, 
but really about her and her relationships with her husbands, with the law, and most importantly and central to her life, her relationships with her daughters. Um, and through, um, you know, the the things that happen in their lives, we get to learn more about life in Elizabethan and Jacobean and Caroline, England. Um, so from 1560, she dies in 1637. So you see this big swath of time um, and get to see this world that we usually see through the eyes of a monarch or through the eyes of, you know, Shakespeare. Um, but to get to see this world through this extremely ambitious, um, extremely problematic, uh, rather ruthless, but very um, devoted at the same time, uh, this woman and, and understand the period through her eyes a little bit. I have so many questions. I'm not even sure where to begin, but I think I'm most curious about like, how did you like, when did Alice become the center of the story as you were unpacking this all as a graduate student, right? You started working on this when you were still a graduate student. Yeah, I started it as a actually a research seminar. It was a, a paper that I wrote for a class. Oh. Um, and it for I didn't meet Alice right away. She came to me later in the project. Um, I was really focused on her eldest daughter and the Countess of Castlehaven, um, mm -hmm. who is at the center of this uh, horrific trial in the 1630s. Um, and I really, historians knew and literary scholars certainly know about the Castlehaven trials. Um, and I wanted to understand the trials through the Countess's perspective of what, what her experience was, because there's not a lot written about that out there. And she's Alice's daughter. Yes, she's Alice's yeah. eldest daughter. Mm -hmm. um, so when I started looking at the Castlehaven trials, I realized that this doesn't make any sense to me at all, like what's happening in the world around the Countess. And that's when I met Alice. And then I realized at that point, um, it was kind of Alice was advanced in her age. And so I realized like how this woman is behind the scenes pulling all of these strings. How does she know how to do that? So I started working backward to understand what their experiences mm -hmm. had been that led up to the trials. And I just realized, like, oh, I have to start at the very beginning and it's Alice that I have to follow. Yeah. And do you remember sort of that moment in the so the collection that mm -hmm. this is based on is at the Huntington Library, but you were a graduate student when you first discovered it. You weren't working there um, as an employee, but it was manuscripts. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no, the Castlehaven trial has scholarship written about it, but the women that you were trying to discover the stories of were not written about. Mm -hmm. So what sort of manu, like, how did you get into their stories and find their voices? Yeah, it's, um, it's it all starts with manuscripts for, for of both course. of us. <laughs> um, but for me, it was really following footnotes that there was a, another book written by a, a historian named Cynthia Harrop. And she wrote this book called The House and Gross Disorder, which if you haven't read it, I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, I've read my copy so many times, like the pages are falling out of it. Um, and she wrote about the Castlehaven trials, but mostly focused on the Earl. And so I used her book because I was in graduate school. I used her book as the way in. And then I started following her footnotes. And I, a lot of her footnotes pointed me to the Huntington. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the Huntington. Um, I got a reader's card <laughs> and I turned to the back of the book and I just found one of her footnotes and I requested the manuscript that she had read. And then I wanted to read it for myself. And then I started crying because I couldn't read the handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> uh. And then I learned how to read the handwriting. And then I you know, just kept following the footnotes. So a lot of the handwriting from the period is written in a script that we call English secretary hand. And the letter forms are quite different from the letter forms we use today. So there are often a lot of tears <laughs> when graduate students, including myself oh. and Vanessa, when you first get into start your research and you get a manuscript in front of you and you look at it and you're like, this will take me 24 hours to read one sentence and I'll still get it wrong. Um, so learning, learning the handwriting is a very important part of graduate school if you're interested in these early modern manuscripts. And there aren't that many places where you can learn to read it. So Vanessa teaches it at the Huntington and I teach it at the Fulcher and it allows you 
access into collections you feel like you're reading something that hasn't been read you know for 400 years or 450 years in many cases because and sometimes it hasn't or it's been read by another scholar or another person 25 years ago or 50 years ago so that there's a sense you do sort of lose sense of space and time when you find these manuscripts and you and especially the ones written by women who are not well represented usually in the print from the period um, but many of them could write very well and have left extensive correspondence and recipe books and devotional manuscripts and literary manuscripts and scientific manuscripts. And um, yeah, you really, you do lose a sense of yeah. like, oh my God, it's, it's, I'm going to be locked in the vault <laughs> if I don't get out soon. I think that's part of what made this, um, made this possible, made this kind of research possible was Alice and her daughters, not unfortunately, not Anne, the, the Countess of Castlehaven, but her two other daughters and Alice are probably the best documented women outside of the royal family at this time period because they were, they just wrote so much. And so once I, once I learned how to read the manuscripts um, and was following the footnotes, you could find them um, they they sued everybody they could possibly. I mean, it, the Castlehaven turns out the Castlehaven trials wasn't Alice's first rodeo. She had been in, entangled in a lot of lawsuits up to that point. Um, so by reading legal briefs and reading wills and reading marriage contracts and correspondence and um, recipe books and household account books, just you know, little tiny receipts of families um, buying Alice started buying a bunch of lace for a while and a bunch of satin and it turns out her middle daughter Frances was about to give birth and they were setting up the nursery so you could start to kind of recreate um, not just the financial world but the material world of these women by following these little tiny strips of paper through through the archive and piecing all of these different kinds of sources together in a way that all, like at the time when I was reading that, I would think like, great rabbit stew again, what on <laughs> earth am I going to do with this? But eventually once you compile enough of it, it's, and you kind of put it in some sort of structure to it, it, it makes the world come alive through these very um, bland looking gnarly manuscripts. Well, and I really, maybe you can describe, there are two big parties or three big parties that you describe in the book that happen after big events in the family or like victories yeah, major family. legal victories yeah and they had these incredible parties and we know a little bit about those from um the perspective of the people who wrote the masks and and the literary residue of those parties but you were able to go into the account books mm -hmm. and sort of chronicle the other expenses and elaborate um, devices that were created to make these parties like the party of the century. <laughs> so maybe you could talk a little bit about those. Yeah. So these, these women live at this moment that we call the Renaissance. They certainly didn't realize, like they didn't call it that, but to us, it's, it's the Renaissance. Um, and Heather's the perfect person to talk to about this. Heather's a Renaissance, a scholar of uh, the English Renaissance from a literary standpoint. And I'm a historian of the same time period. So we like learn this world through very different lenses. Um, but they did, they threw these gigantic parties. So um, Alice and her second husband um, entertained Queen Elizabeth in 1602. And so to entertain her on her summer progress. So Queen Elizabeth would flee London during the summer months because that's when it was hot and stinky and the plague would break out. Um, and so she would go on these progresses through the country, um, in part also to touch base with her, her constituents, I guess. Um, and so Alice and, and her husband, Edgerton, um, Thomas Edgerton, arranged for this massive party. So these actors met Queen Elizabeth at, on, in her whole court in these wagons as they were going down the road. Um, and actors greeted them at the city limits. And then the whole weekend just became this performance, basically. So you never really knew where real life and the play, and it, there was no start. I mean, there was a start when she got there and there was a stop when she left, but the theatrics were just woven into the entire like three-day visit. Um, 
and this is, they just lived with literature constantly as a, as an essential part of the way they express themselves and the way they entertain themselves. So in 1607, when Alice wins this massive 13 year long inheritance lawsuit against her brother-in-law, um, she throws another gigantic party and um, a, a writer called John Marston writes the entertainment and it's filled with allusions to heraldry and references to like Greek and Roman mythology and it's very vibrant and um, there's tons of wine and then they go hunting and then there's more parties and more performances. Um, and the fact that they spent so much money on these parties actually creates almost more sources about it than just the the plays themselves that they perform. Um, and then later in her life, after the Castlehaven trials, they do it again. They have another, the, this family starts to mark these major legal victories with these gigantic parties. Um, and they spend so much money that it's really well documented because it's so much money. Um, but it also is a, I think an important reminder in like it's in understanding this kind of self-fashioning that happens at the time that after these legal victories, after these horrific trials of the Castlehaven trials, it's a way that the family can present itself, like can take control of the narrative a little bit and remind people, um, yes, yes, you know us because we've gone through these like brutal lawsuits, but really we're so lovely and we're just stronger you know, than ever, stronger than ever. And we just, you, you want to be with us. You want to partake in the jubilation all around us. Um, and that actually is, you know, it's new in the Renaissance, the way they do this, this is kind of something that marks the era, but it's something actually that feels weirdly familiar, I think, to all of us. Like once you've gone through something, you know, the, the grueling years of high school, you want to have a party to celebrate and mark the end of it. You want this blowout moment um, because that's how we kind of help close chapters in our own lives with celebration and then move on to something else. And we step forward, like, you know, the life of the party, not the exhausted defendant in a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Alice is such an interesting main character. She's a very complicated woman. Mm -hmm. Um, not entirely lovable, very complicated protagonist. And I think you thread that needle very well in the book, trying to explain or intuit what her um, intentions might be, but it does come down to like how transactional marriage was and how transactional having kids was. And that just that defense of the family firm but with her at the head of it, the matriarch, and then her three daughters and finding the right husbands for them. And that seems like very anti-feminist in a way, but I could you say something a little bit about like, what is the feminist side <laughs> of this story? You know how, because Alice, like she'd be a scary mom yeah. to have, and we can't really know, you know, what sort of um, emotional connections that she had with her three daughters. But she, they were on a course um, and they, she was, it was just this big strategy that she watched and acted and watched and acted and almost to the point of like, okay, you can stop now, <laughs> but she kept going. So what, like, that's, she, I mean, we, we think of, I mean, well, there are many conceptions of women from this period, but how does she sort of break the mold in some ways and not break the mold in other ways? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, well, I think part of what she, where she doesn't break the mold is she, she does what women are supposed to do. Women of her class and of her race at this time are supposed to do. I mean, this is a very class-based mm -hmm. society. Um, so she does what she's supposed to do, and she does it so freakishly well that that's what makes her an unusual, is most people don't do this. Most men don't operate as successfully as she does. Um, she breaks the mold. So she she doesn't break the mold because she follows the script mm -hmm. that she's supposed to follow. She just does it so well. Um, she breaks the mold in that she's so well documented, like the, uh, for a variety of reasons, it's hard, to, archives don't survive hundreds of years always. Um, so it's part of the fact it's just sort of a 
it's the luck of the archive, I guess. That these so there are other archives. Alice's out there. There are other. I'm certain there are <laughs> other Alice's out there. I mean, Bess of Hardwick is yeah. the other kind mm -hmm. of earlier version of Alice. Um, but the question about her as a feminist is a is an important one. It's something I really grappled with because you know I'm a feminist. I'm a feminist historian, um, but Alice is not a feminist. She's a strong woman, but she's not a feminist. She's not trying to make the world better for women. She's not trying to take more agency because of her gender. She's trying to take more agency because of her class. And she wants her daughters to have the privileges that they're entitled to, not because she sees them, she doesn't see anyone as equals. She believes in a very stratified hierarchical world. Mm -hmm. So she's not really a feminist in that she's not advocating for gender equality. She's advocating for status for the people she believes are entitled to certain status. And that's her that she marries into and her daughters um, who are also, you know, perpetuate mm -hmm. the lineage. And so that said, though, I, I do feel like there's a lot of feminism in this work and it's not because of the protagonist. It's because of the all of the literature I read um, to make sense out of her experience. So it's the feminist scholarship that exists that allowed me to that kind of built a framework for me to situate Alice and her daughters within this book could not exist without 40 years of women's history and feminist scholarship that allows us to ask these kinds of questions in ways that we couldn't before. But Alice is definitely not a feminist. She would hate me. She would probably just like most of us. Like she, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's really not trying to break down barriers. She's actually trying to preserve the status quo. Yeah. Well, and always rise. And always oh. rise. <laughs> because she feels entitled to do so because she married an earl and inherited a lot of land. Like, you know, money, mm -hmm. money doesn't buy you status in this society. Land buys you status in the society. Um, patronage from the monarch buys you status. And so she's always trying to accumulate this power, but, you know, not because she wants to share it or do good by it. She wants to establish a dynasty. And, mm -hmm. and she also knows she doesn't have a ton of, she can only control what happens in her own lifetime and then try and instill these same values in her children so that they perpetuate the lineage. And that's the best she can do. She just does it freakishly well. Yeah. <laughs> um so did she write letters to her daughters? Are you getting a lot of your source material from their correspondence? Um, she writes a lot of letters to her youngest daughter who doesn't, who lives, Elizabeth is her name, and she lives in Leicester in the Midlands, and Alice lives further south for most of their mm -hmm. life. Um, so I am like, a, like all historians, we're, we're sick, twisted people because we like families that are separated. We don't like when families spend time <laughs> together because you don't write letters to each other. Um, we need families to be separated so that you can mm -hmm. generate correspondence. So Alice wrote a lot of letters to her youngest daughter. She wrote a lot of letters to her son-in-law, um, her youngest daughter's husband, uh, giving him political advice. And um, some of it he took, some of it uh, her daughter did on his behalf. Um, so she did, she wrote a lot, but mostly um, with, with her middle daughter, Francis, they lived together for a lot of time. So they didn't write any letters to each other. Mm. So I can find their relationship more in household accounts than I oh, can right. Right. in, in correspondence. And is there any, are the letters transactional or is there also any kind of, how are the children? How are the grandchildren? <laughs> Um, what sort of tenderness? Like I always in letters love the footnote or the postscripts okay. because that's when you get like the domestic household information that really tells you what's going on. But was there anything like that? They're not so transactional in that she's asking questions. They're usually like, why isn't he doing this? Why isn't they're more controlling okay. than that? She writes a lot of letters to her grandchildren too. And in one of the letters she writes, um, she says, I'm getting good reports about how well you're doing at school. He's been sent away mm -hmm. to, to school. And so she's complimenting him for his studies. And um, so you can see that she cares about that, like in a multi-generational mm -hmm. yep. way, but there's not a lot of like sweet niceties later in life. Earlier in her life, when she's in her her 20s and 30s, um, she writes a lot of letters to other influential, like her her friends and her um, 
you know, like, um, like Cecil and, mm-hmm. and, um, so she does write these very thoughtful, like, how is your, it was lovely to see you. How is my cousin? They are all called cousin. Um, you know, how is everyone? So she's inquiring like in these gentle, mm-hmm. tender ways early in her life. And then later it gets much more assertive and kind of statements, not questions. Yeah. So it's a controlling strategic mother with three striving daughters who all marry and then some of them marry again when husbands die and then there are crises that happen in that the one marriage in particular with the Earl of Castlehaven. I know um, there is an analogy that can be drawn (laughs) to a family today like it's hard not to think of the Kardashians, right? (laughs) Kris Jenner and, and three daughters. And I know other people have asked you about that as well, but like, it's worth pursuing a little. Where, where did the Kardashians get their, their model? Oh, I think Alice is definitely a, (laughs) Alice and the, the Stanley, I call them my Stanley ladies. The Stanley ladies are very Kardashian-esque and that they all have their own personalities, their own ambitions, their own, you know, lived experiences, but they're, you know, um, there's one big empire, (laughs) one big empires. Yes. Yes. Um, that I really, a lot of the, the giant parties, the Met Gala is the perfect thing to go to. If you've endured some scandal, you know, the weeks before, um, and so I think that a lot of the the patterns that we can recognize in these like families, like the the Jenner's Kardashians, you absolutely can see almost like an origin <laughs> for that in the Stanley women, because it's Alice and she's like, look, you're going to get your act together. You're going to put on a good dress. We're going to have this party. John Milton is going to perform <laughs> and <laughs> it's going to be off the charts. And it's a very similar it's it's really an it's kind of wild how similar the pattern is but it's also you know um Alice probably like uh the you know Chris Jenner probably doesn't suffer fools like she knows mm-hmm. she knows how to do this she knows they're smart business women they know the law they know what they're entitled to they know how to write good contracts they have strong expectations and they're not gonna give it away in any way, give, give power away in any way. And so I think actually a lot of that is you, you see that with Alice and this, this, you know, these few generations of women in England in the the early, the late 16th century, um, it's baked into the society. You are entitled to this. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to blend politics and performance and patronage and family and create a package and rise with that package. You rise as a collective group. You don't rise as an individual. Um, and I think that in a, mm-hmm. in a weird way the Kardashians are like Renaissance women mm-hmm. in that regard. The hardest part of the book for me to read was the trial mm-hmm um for sodomy and rape in which Anne and her mother Alice eventually did explain what had happened to them um and their testimony was read in court Mm -hmm. and I mean no Anne and And her daughter daughter, Elizabeth sorry and but the problem was like the archive goes silent it's such a well-documented trial but Alice goes silent and and maybe maybe that is just things the record has gotten lost and we don't know. But you do make an interesting argument about like, well, maybe Alice is intentionally silent in that moment. And that is part of a grander strategy of letting this trial sort of play itself out with the knowledge that the Earl of Castlehaven would be executed and the two other men would be executed. And then she could emerge sort of untainted from it. But that leaves Anne, her daughter and her granddaughter to deal with this on their own. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine. Yeah, I think what I think Alice really does go silent. So her daughter, Anne, and her granddaughter, Elizabeth, they're all named Anne and Elizabeth, and, um, um, you know, go through these trials um, and their testimony is read on their behalf by by the men in the the courtroom, women are banned from the trial. Women and children are not allowed. There's a proclamation by King Charles that says women and children cannot even attend these trials. Um, so it's like this exclusively male 
space, um, but they are legally victorious in this. And then Alice just starts prolifically writing letters to petition the king and his court to, you know, work out the aftermath of, you know, sort it all out. Um, So she is, I really do think, and this is one of the things that was really hard at a certain point, you know, sitting there with Alice in my head, writing this book. Um, You know, I, I, part of the way I wrote, I wrote these little index cards and I would write um, sources like citations or quotes on them. And I would rearrange them on the table, like how to like little puzzle pieces, like how to, how to work out what was happening. And I finally, you know, at one point I worked it out and it felt like it just sort of clicked like, yep, Alice really did just go quiet for a long time and leave her daughter and her granddaughter to face the fire on their own. I think always with the intention of stepping in afterwards to petition the court. Mm -hmm. Um, But in her petitions, she really blamed her daughter and her granddaughter for what had happened to them. Um, And that part was really hard to write because I, I didn't, ever want to like valorize Alice. But I also was really uncomfortable writing this story where the central character would just publicly victim shame her daughter and granddaughter in such a a way. Um, I don't know that I ever made peace with it, but I think I ultimately just felt like um, this is a story that needs to be told. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we need to be able to to think with this story, the the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, And this is what Alice did. And I I don't want to make excuses for it because I think personally, I find it inexcusable, but I also, that said, I also don't feel like as a historian, I'm here to judge the subjects of the past. I'm here to understand what motivated them um, so that I can then think with that later. So Mm -hmm. that's the, that's the piece I made with Alice is I just, I want to think with her. And I don't agree with what, how she handled things, but I, you know, we get something out of thinking with her. And in many ways, I mean, she always, through all the evidence you present, she took the long view of her family lineage. This has been built up over a couple of generations and she's wants this line to succeed Mm -hmm. for many more generations. And so she's looking at that goal, not the blips that, not that this is a blip. No, no, but but it's never about one person. Yeah. Yeah. And and what happened with Anne and the the family firm, Um, what happened with Anne and her daughter, Elizabeth and the Castle Haven Childs, even that I think for Alice was not, it's hard to imagine because we think about like these individual relationships in our own lives. Like it's, it's hard to think of. We don't, we tend not to think collectively in that Mm -hmm. way when it comes to family, but I really genuinely do not believe that Alice could think about an individual person without thinking of the collective. Yeah. And so um, advocating for her daughter and granddaughter or punishing them or being punitive with her love or actions with them um, is always about the whole. It's never about them as individuals. Good. Which is wild. <laughs> Thank you so yeah, much for this conversation. You. I think we'll open it up to questions now, if there are any in the room or on Zoom. Not yet? Yeah. If she had sons, what kind of a mother do you think she would be? Or do you ever imagine what would be different if she hadn't had these daughters who were sort of products, like this is a brand? these are the products, but how do you envision it being different if she had sons? So the question is, what would it have been like if Alice had had sons? Oh my gosh. I don't think I've ever thought about this before, actually, which is weird. Um, honestly, I think it would be the same. I don't think Alice would, I, I know, I think Alice would have told her son, you're going to marry this girl and you're going to make babies with that girl and you're going to go to the inns of court and you're going to study law and you're going to be whatever the queen or king tells you you're going to be and you're going to do that job well and you're going to hire poets and playwrights and you're going to build a library and you're going to you know be good to your tenants um but you're going to make sure everyone knows that you're good to your tenants and so i really think her mo would have been the same regardless of of the the gender of her children um she, the details would be different, but I think her expectations were the same. She treated her brothers 
that same way she her nephew she was really close with her her nephew Robert Spencer who inherited the the Spencer line kind of goes through him um she was very controlling of of him um and hosted events at his house and told him what he was going to do and who she hired Ben Johnson to do the entertainment at his party you know so she was pretty controlling in that regard too so I think she um it didn't really matter the gender of her children and it wasn't just her children she was controlling it was her husband's it was her brothers-in-law it was her nephew it was her sisters you know she was um really believed that she knew what was right for everyone regardless of of their gender it's a really interesting question what was her education so it's a question about um, their education. Allison, her daughters, her, her okay. Um, yeah, Alice's education was, um, I think, pretty similar to other women, uh, like gentle women of her her status. So she was raised at Althorpe, which is, um, you know, Althorpe, <laughs> the where the Spencers still are today. Um, at the time, though, it was much smaller, and it was a gigantic gigantic sheep farm. And so she would have been raised with music with she could read and read English. It, there's no indication that she could read, you know, French or Latin. I think her daughters could read a little bit of French. Her middle daughter, I think, could read French. Um, but so she was they were all completely literate. Um, and she was really trained in like housewifery, like how to estate management is what she would have been trained to draw probably a little bit, but drawing wasn't terribly popular at that. It becomes popular in the 18th century for women to be able to draw in 19th century, but in the 16th century in England, on the continent, it's different, but in England, it was not, drawing wasn't terribly um, essential for a woman's education, but estate management, how to, like what kind of staff you need, how to manage the budget, who to hire, how, uh, the, you know, acts of being a good courtier a math. Yeah. But also it was more like you hire a good bookkeeper. You don't do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Learning how to, you know, knowing who the right people to keep in your employment. I think that's part of the estate management training. It's, you know, I, I picture it like almost going to like, you know, organizational leadership <laughs> camp. Um, you know, she, Alice kept an enormous household, like a, a weirdly large household throughout her life. So she had always at least 40 servants around her, which was pretty big at the time. So she needed to make sure that she was, you know, promoting the right people to keep the books um, and also promoting the right people to fix the fences and manage the properties. And yeah, so she was but she had a very like traditional education, whereas other contemporaries like, you know, um, earlier generations like um, Thomas More, you know, gave his daughters a very classic humanist education. Alice didn't get that. And she didn't give that to her daughters. She trained them all to be literate and good courtiers and good managers of their estate. Yeah. <laughs> So is there a part of the story that you found interesting about Alice that did not make it into the book? Um, really the part I think that didn't make it in the book wasn't about Alice. It was about um, the aftermath of her life. Um, and that she, at the end of the book, I, I do say that in her will, she left money to build these almshouses in Harefield. Um, and so one of the things that happened, so the, the almshouses are still standing and um, they're run by the Harefield parochial charities. And one of the parts that I really tried to find a way to put in the book and I just couldn't was I had this unbelievable opportunity to meet the two women that live at the almshouses, the two widows that live there. They invited me into their home. I didn't just show up and knock on the door. I had, you know, made arrangements. Um, and just the the time that I got to spend talking with them um, and getting to know them. And Alice was almost irrelevant to that, but just to be in that space and to see how um, 
you know, these women in the community today are still living in this, in these houses and using the houses and felt a connection, like her, her coat of arms is on the door there and they walk by it every day. And they kind of talked about her as feeling like she's their protector in a way like that, that opportunity to kind of see the rippling effects of, of her life, um, and kind of this imagined patronage in a way, um, that part was really special. And I just couldn't, it was too, um, like self-reflective, but it, it made it about me and my experience and not about Alice and her experience, but it was a, a really, just one of the most unforgettable days. Yeah. I mean, those are beneficiaries 400 years mm -hmm. after her death who, I mean, that's a continuous history that yeah. really does keep her legacy alive. Yeah. And, but it's also, you know, it, it started, I realized like this, this is a separate thing because it's, it also, it's not, I, you know, not like a straight line, like Alice willed it in, you know, 1637, therefore for time eternal, like so many people have made the choice over and over mm -hmm. again to keep Alice's patronage an essential part of Harefield. Mm -hmm. And there's a street named after her. It's a modern street that's named after her. Um, it's called Countess Close. It's the little drive. So, you know, I, it was too easy to make that all about Alice and her influence, but really it's because so many other people made the choice that they wanted to perpetuate her, you know, keep her, her gift going. Um, so I, you know, I realized like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to rob those people of yeah. that agency and make it about her. Cause really other people made that mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. One more. Um, um, so the question is about uh, breastfeeding and whether Alice said anything about breastfeeding or um, commented on it and what she did with her daughters or what she wanted. Alice didn't say anything at all about, about it, um, but I know through correspondence that her youngest daughter did use wet nurses. And so I don't, I think that that, which was pretty common for elite women at the time to use a wet nurse in the village um, to hire a woman to, to be a nurse, breastfeed their children. Um, so I know that um, for several of, of her grandchildren, we we know for a fact they were um, breastfed by a wet nurse. And so I don't think that she had a, took issue with it or anything, but in her way, and I know her daughters definitely chose to do it. Oh my gosh, this is a great question. This is a perfect question for both of us. Um, so the question is about where the source material came from, if libraries buy these things or if they're gifted. Um, the, the two core collections that I used for this research um, are at the Huntington Library in San Marino outside Los Angeles. And they were, it's the Ellesmere paper, Ellesmere collection and the Hastings papers. And they were both purchased at the beginning of the 20th century by Henry Huntington, the, the founder of the library. So a lot of the, the turn of the 20th century, a lot of English noble families started selling their art collections and selling their libraries to raise money to keep their estates. Um, so a lot of material, some of it down the street at the Folger. Um, the founder of the library where I work and the founder where, of the library where Heather works, they were um, collecting rivals, <laughs> East Coast, West Coast <laughs> kind of rivalry here. Um, and so a lot of this material came to the United States because families, when given the choice of, do you want to sell your land or do you want to sell your art collection and library, they chose the art collection and library. Um, so I, weirdly, I did most of this work in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, and then I came to the Folger um, for a while uh, to do some of the research. And I did a lot of it at the British Library and any place Alice owned land. Um, at the local record offices there, she also sued people. Um, so I could, I drove around to a lot of local record offices 
but the current it. Earl of Derby has some manuscripts, a couple still in his collection. Yeah, right? the, the current Earl of Derby, he's the 19th Earl of Derby, and he still, he lives at Knowsley Hall, which is one of the estates where Alice lived. Um, and he has a manuscript for her, the, uh, of this beautifully lavish manuscript um, made for her. Um, and then he has a, a funeral account book for the fourth Earl of Derby. Here's um, a picture that's, from it. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the pictures. <laughs> Um, and he was very kind in opening up his library so that I could um, actually uh, someone on his his staff reached out to me and told me about this material. And then I went to Nosley Hall and looked in their library and he's made this extremely um, accessible to me as well, which is really generous. Yeah. Yeah, the question is about um, Anne Clifford, who is also quite famous for these massive inheritance lawsuits. Um, they were, they definitely would have known each other. They, there's not correspondence. I don't think they were close or like in the, the same like inner circle, um, but they definitely would have known e each other um, or their families would have known each other. Anne Clifford is kind of the example of where the lawsuits uh, for various reasons don't go in her favor like Alice was really good at navigating the law and tried different tactics she remarried multiple times and um, Alice only remarried once so Alice kind of got her second husband to protect her interests and set all of this money aside for her um, and Anne was not that that didn't happen for Anne her husbands kind of kept swindling her out of her I mean they were legally entitled to it but they also were not setting her up for success the way um, Alice's second husband was so they are really interesting figures to like think about side by side because they both together demonstrate the different options the legal options that women had and the ways that husbands, especially second and third husbands, could either be legal allies to their wives or they could be legal adversaries to their wives. So in Alice's case, legal ally. In she Anne Clifford's case, yeah, she married her lawyer. <laughs> lawyer. Um, so her lawsuit became their lawsuit. Anne Clifford, you know, kept marrying men who would kind of use her suits to their advantage and then leave her with nothing. And so it, it kind of demonstrates that there's not a single formula for how this works. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you to everybody who watched at home and sent in such fascinating questions. Most of all, thank you to Vanessa and Heather for that fascinating conversation. Um, Vanessa has graciously agreed to sign copies of the book. If you still need a copy, they are upstairs at the cash register, so you can still get one. Um, we also ask, as we always do at these events, if you don't mind folding up your chair on your way out and putting it up against the wall, we will help with that. Um, if you have trouble, they can be tricky. Um, and yes, we will we'll have signing ready just right here. And please um, go buy a copy if you haven't yet. Thank you so much.